Hi, everyone. Again, this is Kathy Wood from ARK Invest. Uh, just summarizing uh, some of the insights we've had from this week. Uh, we'll start uh, today with fiscal policy, then monetary policy, uh, and then we'll go into the economy and, and uh, some market signals. And uh, throughout all of this, we'll weave in how innovation is really taking hold uh, in this difficult environment. Uh, so uh, first fiscal policy, uh, the PPP program, the pay Paycheck Protection Plan, um, is, is slowly uh, getting into the system, although it seems to be uh, more limited than we expected uh, to places like restaurants and um, uh, small mom and pop retail and, and services. Uh, and uh, so what we're seeing from an innovation point of view is companies like uh, Square and PayPal really coming to the rescue, fintech broadly defined. Uh, and what we're seeing is the loans that uh, Square and PayPal are putting out there are much smaller in size than uh, are the banks, and they're taking place much faster. Uh, so Square's average loan size is about $12,000. Uh, JP Morgan's is about $120,000. Uh, we would, uh, be we believe that JP Morgan's um, is not able to deliver this kind of service profitably, whereas Square and PayPal, uh, because of their digital infrastructure, are able to do so. Uh, and they're able to do so much more quickly uh, I mentioned last week that uh, we know of a business that uh, for a, a, a loan from a bank, PPP related, and uh, never heard back from them. Uh, and so resorted to Square. And within a day, uh, last week I mentioned uh, he had been approved. And then the following day, uh, he actually received the money. Uh, so this is blazing a trail uh, that the traditional financial sector is going to have trouble following, we believe. And uh, the, the benefits to Square and Cash App are enormous. Uh, April saw it was a record-breaking month for almost every metric within the Cash App ecosystem. Uh, so uh, the direct deposits... Uh, they, they are up more than three to four fold. Uh, we, they saw record uh, stock trading, record uh, purchase and sales of Bitcoin. Uh, and so the ecosystem is on fire. Uh, and we saw uh, hints of it in their earnings. Uh, they have decided to spend a lot more uh, helping their merchants and other customers uh, and so uh, we're not seeing some of these top line or revenue numbers drop down to the bottom line yet, but they are uh, accruing such goodwill uh, and uh, are gaining so much traction that we think the payoff is going to be huge longer run. And the same was true uh, for PayPal as well, especially with Venmo. Uh, also on fiscal policy, uh, we... Um, uh, heard three new ideas this week. Uh, uh, some of these the president mentioned, some of these are um, leaks coming out of the administration, but three new ideas for the next package, which will be much more of a stimulus package than a relief package, uh, if it takes place. Uh, and these are very important. If, if, if any of these happens, I think is going to be huge for certainly the equity markets. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, the payroll tax holiday uh, through year end. Uh, we heard President Trump mention that uh, one himself uh, this week. So uh, that's, that's alive and well. Uh, the second was a, um, uh, the possibility that uh, our ta we won't have to pay for our 2019 tax bill until the end of this year instead of July 15th. And the third, uh, and this probably is the least likely, but if it happened, it would be, it would have the most impact, we believe, on 
uh, the equity markets, and that would be a capital gains tax rate cut. Uh, now, you're hearing a lot of talk th these weeks about how it is certain that taxes have to go up, uh, and especially corporate taxes, and I'm sure uh, many would lump uh, capital gains tax rates in with that. If we see uh, the opposite uh, in the forms of a capital gains tax rate reduction, I think the uh, ramifications for the equity market will be huge. Um, the equity markets have moved quite dramatically uh, since the middle of March with hardly a correction at all, uh, a going against uh, consensus expectations and leading us away from uh, this notion that we're in a bottoming process. Um, uh, if any of these uh, measures are taken, I think that will be more fuel for the fire. But we have to say after this magnificent a move uh, that a correction would not be surprising at all. Uh, by bottoming process, many believe that uh, that um, that means we'll revisit the old lows. Uh, I, I do not believe that uh, will happen. Uh, we're g gathering enough evidence right now uh, that we're certainly not in a depression. And uh, there are a number of green shoots, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, monetary policy. Uh, this week, something very important happened as far as what the futures market thinks is going to happen uh, in terms of the Fed funds rate. Uh, uh, it expects negative fund, Fed funds rate. Now, I think um, Chairman Powell and the Fed, uh, other Fed members, uh, w would hope that does not happen. Uh, so the futures market is betting um, against uh, the Fed's own expectations. They've basically said they'd prefer to do more in QE than to see interest rates go negative. And uh, it's actually a little bit of a distinction without a difference because uh, um, according to one analysis I saw this week, for every $800 billion of uh, liquidity that the Fed provides, that would be the equivalent of a 100 basis point reduction in the Fed funds rate. So given the amount of uh, 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 liquidity that the Fed is pushing into the system and will continue to push into the system, uh, uh, it could be the equivalent of the Fed funds rate going uh, negative. So we shall, we shall see on that. Um, in the market, the market signals are interesting. Uh, the two-year uh, Treasury yield did go to all-time lows uh, this week, again, with this expectation in the futures market uh, that the Fed funds rate itself would go negative. Uh, and we did see um, the spread between uh, double B and triple B bonds uh, turn around and go back up. That actually started last week. Uh, and is getting close uh, to old highs. We saw United Airlines having to downsize its junk bond offering. Uh, so at the margin in the, in the fixed income markets, there's, uh, there's still quite a bit of concern about uh, how much damage is being done out there and, uh, and when some of these uh, hard hit sectors are going to turn around uh, and which companies will make it until that time. Uh, so, and the same is true in the consumer discretionary sector, uh, credit default swaps uh, are still levitating uh, to, uh, near their highs. So again, this question of which retailers are going to be able to make it through. Uh, we saw Neiman Marcus and J. Crew didn't make it through this week. Uh, so those concerns are uh, uh, under, to completely understandable. Uh, as far as uh, the economics, uh, the most important indicator we got this week was uh, the employment report. And um, it was uh, not as bad in some ways as many anticipated, but then again, we were expecting a terrible report. And if you look at the household survey, 
which tends to capture more small businesses than the non-farm payroll survey, um, what you found is uh, the equivalent of 20% employment. Uh, because, uh, because of some uh, technical differences, the actual unemployment rate came out below expectations, 14.7%. So this does not capture all of the small businesses. Uh, uh, expectations were 16%. So even on the non-farm payroll basis, it was somewhat better than expected. Uh, there were a couple of surprises in, in, in the details. Uh, the first uh, for me was, I couldn't believe it when I saw it, uh, expectations for uh, average hourly earnings we're for an increase of 0.4% month to month. This is not an annualized number. Uh, what uh, was reported was an increase of 4.7%. Uh, again, not annualized, uh, and it's a monthly number. Uh, what this suggests is uh, the mix shift um, is extreme out there. Uh, the, the lower wage jobs, have been hit so hard compared to the higher wage jobs uh, that we're seeing uh, one of the biggest increases in average hourly earnings uh, that I've ever seen. I don't think there's been a bigger one. Uh, now, many people just dismissed that, but these are the kinds of numbers that go into the personal income reports and the savings reports. Uh, and so they're, they're, I think it is meaningful. Uh, so, and it may be why uh, the market uh, is is reacting so well to the to the report. On a year over year basis, the average hourly earnings uh, were up seven point nine percent versus expectations of three point three percent. So, uh, I think that's important. The other number I thought was important was uh, the average work week, the length of the average work week. Um, the expectations were that it would drop from 34.1 to 33.5. Instead, it actually increased to 34.2. Now, these sound like uh, small differences, and we're really getting into the bowels of this report, and is it really that important? These are really important numbers in terms of impacting all kinds of other economic statistics that we're going to be seeing uh, the rest of the month. They won't be pretty at all, uh, but they are going to be better than what we thought was going to be the case uh, when this virus first hit. Uh, so um, that's a little bit of uh, good news. The other bit of good news that came out was that uh, the productivity numbers, while they were down minus 2.5% uh, quarter to quarter at an annual rate for the first quarter, uh, they were not as bad uh, as expected. Uh, they, the, the expectation was for a decline of 5.5%. Uh, so that means that uh, March numbers weren't as bad as uh, initially estimated. Um, the other thing, the other confirmation we got this week was in capital spending, uh, non-defense capital goods orders, ex-aircraft, uh, were fairly flat for the month of March. Uh, and again, the notion that capital spending, except in the uh, hard hit oil sector, which is that, that uh, sector we're seeing record lows in terms of the the rig count for uh, oil and uh, natural gas. Uh, uh, and um, so that, that sector is very hard hit and will impact this number going into April. Uh, but uh, it was good to see that capital spending plans were, uh, were uh, stabilizing or stable even with the March numbers in there. We also saw inventories at the wholesale level. So between retail and manufacturing, down by 0.8%. So there wasn't a backing up of inventory into the system. Uh, and in fact, it suggests that if the consumer does uh, start moving uh, forward faster uh, than expected um, across the economy, that businesses are going to have to run to catch up. And the, that's the makings of what we have been calling this V-shaped recovery. And I know a lot of 
Uh, I know a lot of economists don't think that's possible, but it does seem like the stars could be aligning. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then I'd like to also go through a few um, metrics associated uh, with the most cyclical sector, so housing and autos, um, and how innovation is uh, perhaps helping those sectors. Uh, in, in terms of housing, we got uh, the report from Zillow and Redfin, two online um, real estate companies. And uh, I think they are surprised at how quickly, how well housing has held up and how quickly it's coming back. Uh, uh, Zillow's CEO, Rich Barton, said yesterday uh, that they've gone from uh, a fr uh, basically looking at uh, uh, a red light to a yellow light, and now they're starting to see uh, some green lights move into the real estate sector, moving uh, moving forward. Uh, so that that's real time. That report came out uh, just yesterday, uh, and their virtual tours uh, in the last three months are up five hundred and twenty five percent. These are three D virtual tours, and um, they have probably changed the way real estate is going to, uh, the real estate world is going to be uh, evolving, you know, less human uh, interaction. And that's not just in terms of showing homes, uh, but also uh, the online um, the, the online paperwork, original, the paperwork that uh, used to cause so much friction uh, around title and escrow and so forth, moving online. And uh, DocuSign is, certainly, um, is start, certainly moving in that direction. Um, in the auto space, uh, uh, less innovation going on there, but uh, there is a fear, it seems, according to NXPI, one of the largest chip manufacturers for the auto space, they're noticing in China that uh, first time auto buyers have increased dramatically. And that is because uh, they don't want to uh, go back to the mass transit systems they had been using uh, because of the, uh, the, the obvious reason is the, the coronavirus. So auto sales in China which actually is the largest market in terms of units for auto sales, um, could surprise on the high side of expectations. Uh, and we are seeing uh, companies use uh, the, the expression V-shaped recovery when it comes to China. Uh, so if autos uh, are a part of uh, that recovery, and it seems, according to NXPI, that they are, um, then again, uh, uh, that's going to be very good news for the auto uh, supplier ecosystem, which has been crucified. Uh, and we're also seeing, as I mentioned last week, used car prices dropping at a record rate, uh, partly because Hertz and uh, Avis are, having, are being forced to sell more into that market than otherwise be, would be the case, uh, because they're having... Uh, uh, extreme financial difficulties uh, hurts uh, perhaps more than than Avis. So that too could um, could cause a, a clearing out of the used car market faster than otherwise uh, might might have been the case. And for the same reason, auto uh, sales are taking place in China. Uh, I think there's um, a rethinking. Of, uh, of transportation generally, and uh, perhaps some of those who uh, had been uh, uh, using mass transit perhaps for all their lives might be more open uh, to, to their own autos now. Uh, and then finally, I think in terms of the innovation space, uh, one we got some shocking statistics. Trade Desk uh, uh, reported yesterday that viewership for primetime TV is down 18% on a year-over-year -year basis. Now, uh, this is through March. Uh, and uh, Roku also reported yesterday, and they're reporting, so Roku is the equivalent of um, 
uh, it's providing the equivalent of a TV operating system uh, for video on demand. And its viewership was up 80% year over year. Uh, TV ads, so uh, linear TV ads, uh, are down 44% on a year over year basis. The upfront market, which is taking place right now, uh, looks like it's uh, going to be uh, down 20%. Uh, this used to be a uh, a very important indicator of the health of the U.S. economy, but we can't look at it that way now. There is a huge shift taking place away from linear TV uh, towards streaming video on demand. So, of course, Roku will be a beneficiary, Netflix, Amazon this week, very interestingly, um, added to its prime service, so for the same price, uh, some some gaming, uh, streaming gaming. So it's increasing the allure of its uh, prime service uh, during a time when many people are stuck at home and uh, gaming has just taken off. So uh, we're, we're excited about uh, how much traction innovation is gaining right now. We're seeing many executives in, uh, in the digital world saying that it feels like um, three years uh, of future progress in digital, which would have been their forecast, has been compressed into two to three months. Uh, and, uh, you know, as we've said for quite some time, innovation always gains traction during difficult times. It's better, cheaper, faster, more productive, and, uh, and, and more creative uh, as companies try to salvage their revenues uh, and profits. Uh, so we're happy that, uh, we're happy to be doing research in this space uh, and to share it with you. Uh, our website is arc-invest, Dot com. That's our research website. And um, we have new uh, blogs going up uh, every week, uh, which are very focused on um, how the world's changing, how it is going to change, and how much more quickly it seems to be changing now. Uh, so that's it for this week. And um, I hope it's a nice spring weekend uh, across the U.S. and that you're going to enjoy this weekend. So thank you once again. Bye.